Colin is the author of this talk. This is the scientific evidence. It's thermometers, not computer models. How unusual are these recent trends? And thirdly, really to try to answer the skeptics, has the climate always changed? So we'll look at the possible natural drivers that may account for the current global warming. But I can tell you in advance that we're going to dismiss all of them. But we'll come onto that later on. And then later on we'll come back to this why should we care. But before we move into the science, let's remind ourselves why this has become such an emotional subject. And I won't talk about these slides in any detail, but just let's remind ourselves the dear old polar bear has become a bit of an icon in this. Why? Because Polar bears live on seals. They can only catch seals on ice floes. If ice floes disappear, they can't catch their food, and some of them starve. This is a Syrian refugee. <coughs> Between 2006 and 2009, there was long-term drought in Syria. Many thousands of people moved from the villages to the towns, causing a lot of civil unrest, particularly when the government did nothing about it. That civil unrest led in 2011 to the outbreak of the war that's still going on there. Think back to what I said at the beginning. It was the drought between 2006 and 2009 which precipitated, not necessarily the whole war, but certainly a lot of the civil unrest. Now let's come much closer to home, November 2009, Cumbria, and let's jump straight ahead to December 2015, not all that long ago. Now Storm Desmond, 4th and 5th of December last year, was a quite remarkable storm because um, lots of records were broken but the, the biggest one was the amount of rainfall in 24 hours and that, uh, the, the bottom of that band, if you start from there to there is how much rain fell on Honister Pass in 24 hours really quite an exceptional rainfall, it's not surprising that we have massive, massive flooding it's, it's not easy, and in fact no, no proper climate scientist worth his name will say that any individual episode of um, heavy rainfall is attributable to climate change. But what they will say is the chances of such episodes increase year by year as global temperature goes up. And the interesting thing, going back to the 2009 slide, and then 2015, that 2015 episode shouldn't have happened for 400 years after the rainfall in 2009. That's the, it's the frequency of these events which is going to <coughs> increase more and more as the years go by. And the other thing about Cumbria, in fact the whole country last December, was that it was the warmest December since records began in 1910. And that again illustrates what happens with climate change, that it sort of creeps up on us and you get more and more records broken, but they tend to be the warmer records rather than the colder records. But having said that, they'll still get cold events. And that's what confuses some people, if it suddenly gets very cold and they oh, there's no global warming. It doesn't work like that. You will get cold events even when there's climate change pushing temperatures upwards it will get more significant warm events, if you understand me. So what's the evidence for warming? Well, I'll go through this very quickly. Don't worry about the detail on that slide. It just reminds us that there are thousands and thousands of accurate temperature records coming from land-based stations around the world. I'll leave it to that tonight. But what about the two-thirds of the globe that's covered by water? Well, here again, we're now very well served by these Argo floats. There are about 
3,800 of them now, dotted round the oceans of the world, which measure the temperature and salinity of the oceans. So there's a huge, absolutely massive amount of temperature data out there. So what do people do with it? Well, it's compiled into global temperature records. So somehow you have to crunch all this data into a global temperature record. And it's been done by some remarkably august scientific bodies, of which the three that we're going to talk about tonight, shortly I'll show you, uh, is NASA. Now you may think, well, NASA, hang on, they just put people on the moon. No, they don't. They're also very, very interested in what's happening on planet Earth. There's NOAA, which is roughly equivalent to the Environment Agency in the US. And there's our very own UK Met Office uh, and the Climate Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. So these bodies take all this data, they make some adjustments to it, um, largely to take into account the fact that all these stations are spread um, they're not equally around the world, so they have to do some interpolation. Or in some cases where stations are close to city centres, they obviously have to make adjustments for the heat island effect. <coughs> and up in the Arctic there's fairly poor coverage, so they have to interpolate the results there as well. So immediately some skeptics may say, oh, hey, this is all you know, massaging data, this, this must all lead to some really um, uh, imprecise results. But amazingly, those three bodies I've talked about already, quite independently, have come up between 1880 and the present with a graph there which, frankly, for most people, is the same, isn't it? So that is, um, I think, the beginning of the realisation about why there's this consensus among climate scientists about global warming is because everyone's coming up with the same results. But there was one physicist called Richard Muller um, who was not at all happy about what was going on and he decided to set up his own um, uh, uh, little organisation where he recruited some remarkably bright people, including a Nobel Prize winner. To look again at this data, um, he was definitely a skeptic. He had to use the same uh, basic data from, from the thermometers. He wasn't arguing about that. It wasn't so much the, the raw data, it was what people did with this after they'd got it. And what happened? After he trunched all that data with his own professional experts and so on, he came up with the same graph, the same graph. So just for a few minutes, just here, hopefully, this time, didn't work in that way. let's see if we can work this time. You're going to hear a little bit of Richard Muller. <coughs> So my daughter and I, at that time, had a consulting firm, decided we would set up a nonprofit organization to study climate change ourselves. We brought in some really good people, uh, extraordinarily good people. I mean, at the level that Sol Perlman was a member of our team and co-author of our papers, when it was announced that he won the Nobel Prize in Physics. So we had really good Art Rosenfeld, who was a hero in energy conservation. But these were all people who shared the same doubts that I had. So we wound up doing an enormous effort, completely rebuilding a program to use historic temperature records, and did it in what we believe to be the best statistical approach to doing this. We managed to put together a record. We studied the systematics. I had no hope that we'd be able to address all the systematics. In the end, we could, and that came as a wonderful surprise to me. Uh, each one required a great deal of effort. 
uh, poor station quality, the urban heat island effect, the data adjustment that's, uh, that, that, that's been done, and most important of all, the data selection bias. The fact that every other team was using less than 20% of the data, in some cases only, only about 7% of the data. So how do they pick their data? And, and, and did that lead to a bias, even an inadvertent bias? So we managed to address all these. And in the end, we got a nice curve, a curve that showed the temperature. And it was rising. Now, we never expected to address the question of what caused it. Uh, I tried fitting it to an exponential. It actually wasn't a very good fit. Try the parabola. No, it wasn't a good fit either. Okay, try the US population. No, it wasn't so good. Hey, dummy, try carbon dioxide. Smack on. Right, uh, that does go on a bit, that um, thing, but we're going to stop it now because the central thing about uh, a skeptic who's seen the light, you see, and you prepared to go public on that. And he's continued to do lectures like this around the world, where he is admitting that his original skepticism was misplaced. And that is the current graph from Berkeley Earth's organisation. Um, and you can actually compare it with NASA, which is the most up-to-date slide <coughs> you can see it goes to August 2016. Um, and you can see that uh, NASA and Berkeley Earth have really got very similar slides. So that's the skeptics, that's the skeptics, that's NASA. And uh, Adcraft, uh, University of East Anglia now, they all have very, very similar graphs. However, do we need to rely entirely on thermometers to work out whether or not there's global warming? Answer, no, not at all, because there's lots of other thermometers or things that behave like thermometers. And one of the big things there is the ocean, because ocean volume increases due to thermal expansion in a, warming, in a warming world. The Greenland ice cap melts, and we'll come back to that in a moment. The Antarctic ice melts, glaciers all over the world, and there are glaciers incidentally all over the world, even on the equator. They're all melting. Um, and of course, if the world's cooling, then water goes down. So basically, sea level changes always act like a thermometer in a, in a, a micro thermometer. So there is sea level between 1993 and the present. As measured by satellites, and you think, well, hang on, satellites, they're there miles above the Earth, how can they do this accurately? They, in fact, they get extremely precise measurements um, of sea level. And just to demonstrate that, you'll see there in 2011, because there was significant flooding in Pakistan and Australia that year, that took a bit of water out of the ocean. Not a lot, but enough for there to be a slight dip in sea level during that year. But the next slide, in some ways, is even more interesting because this goes back to 1870. Of course, that's the, the blue is tidal stations and then the red is satellite data. But you can see there that not only has been a steady rise in sea level since 1880, but it is accelerating. Rise, and there's no chance of it stopping at the moment. In fact, some cities and towns at sea level are already experiencing this sort of thing. This isn't a tsunami, you know, or a hurricane. This is just a normal high tide in Miami. Um, and this is happening all over the world in towns which are close to sea level. The other thing that obviously tells us that the globe is warming up are glaciers. Now this is um, an example of a glacier from Greenland, where you can see that the glacier top in 1850 is way above the level that it was in 2010. But I'm now going to take another little break myself and invite you to watch a very interesting video um, which speaks for itself. So I want to more on just trying to get started. <coughs> it 
in the early 1930s, there was a territorial dispute between Denmark and Norway over who should have the right to East Greenland. Both Denmark and Norway, they made a lot of aerial mapping. So they took pictures from airplanes of the land and also of the glaciers. And for us, this is just a really a gold mine because they're showing a snapshot of the state of the glaciers prior to the satellite. Right now, we are in a period where temperatures are rising and we're seeing that the glaciers are retreating very rapidly, making the global sea level rise. And we are very interested to finding out how vulnerable is the ice sheet to temperature changes. And we can do that by figuring out what has happened in the past when temperatures were also changing. So we hired a plane and a photographer, so we would take a picture from the exact same place where they were flying in the 1930s to make these then and now images. When you look at the old picture, you can see that the glacier is, uh, that is very dirty. This is debris from the movement of the glacier when it scrapes the mountains and the bedrock it takes with it a lot of material. If we go uh, 80 years forward to 2013, you can see the glacier has retreated a lot. And here you see not only a huge retreat, but we can also see that with the retreat comes a lowering of the surface. You can see on the sides of the mountains in the modern picture, there's a line, it's almost like a bathtub ring, where the glacier used to be. And here, the lowering has been more than 400 meters. So it's a lot of mass that has disappeared uh, from land and gone into the ocean to contribute to the global sea level rise. Back then, they were flying in open things. They didn't have any oxygen or anything. And then they went up to about 5,000 meters, reaching temperatures of minus 30 degrees. Looking at this picture of Milko Glacier in August 1933, you can just see the tail of the plane. This uh, photo was recorded out the back. Then, if we go to 2013, uh, there's still a lot of ice in the water, but it's actually very hard to find the glacier from. You have to go all the way back in the picture, because this glacier has retreated more than 30 kilometers in the meantime. This is a huge retreat, and um, among the biggest in all of Greenland. It's not always a straight-up relationship between rising temperatures and retreat and mass loss of the glaciers. It comes in, in spurts, so to say. It's super complicated to predict, and this is part of the uh, reason we are so interested in going back in time to find out uh, if there has been periods where glaciers were losing mass very rapidly. In the 1930s, when uh, these brave pilots were flying over Greenland recording pictures of the glaciers, they had no idea what was about to happen in the future. They were not concerned about global warming or about rising sea level, but this data that they recorded had become a very important piece in putting together the history of the glaciers and to give us more knowledge that can help us better understand what will happen in the future. Thousands of years, 
and you can calculate from those ice cores the temperature and even more important in some ways the CO2 level when, uh, when the ice actually formed. It's an amazing way of, of delving back into the past. Tree rings, corals, stalactites. So these things allow temperature reconstructions to go back way beyond uh, 1880. And in 1999, uh, a guy called Michael Mann co-authored um, a publication which then got taken up by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. They put it in their uh, 2001 report. And this is the famous hockey stick graph. And this is <coughs> This is the graph which set the whole thing alight. This is when people realise, God, this is a bit unusual, what's happening here with global warming. Uh, now, don't try and understand the detail here, but please do understand why it's called the hockey stick. And this, thanks to my youngest son, the hockey. Um, here, is the, here is the hockey stick. So, can't quite get up there. Um, <laughs> But you'll see what this graph is showing. It, it starts in the year uh, 1000. So just before William Conqueror came across the channel. Um, and you'll see from there until about 1900, overall, was a slight decline in global temperature. That was the big surprise. But I'll mention in a moment why that fits in with another bit of science that we'll come on to. But of course, after 1900, that's where we are now. So this is why the whole thing has become rather alarming, isn't it? Now, has uh, Keith taken his photograph? Yes. Yes, you've done it, have you? Right. You've done it a bit closer to, but... Oh, you're doing it. Keith, the organiser tonight, wanted a picture of a hockey stick, OK? Um, so that was um, a graph, or still is actually, which is really quite, uh, quite striking when you see it for the first time. I mean, how many people have seen this graph before? Yeah, some of you, but I don't think have them. Okay. So this is really why governments around the world, as well as private scientists, said, so, yeah. This is really serious, what's happening here. But still, there are people out there, and there still are people out there, and some of you may be here tonight, who say, well, hang on, how do we find the always change? Okay, so we've got this huge acceleration um, in recent years, but isn't that just natural? So now, for the last part of this talk, we're going to talk about what are the possible drivers so we'll start off with the sun. We can actually get through these fairly quickly, I assure you. Because the sun, again, I can use this hockey stick, it's quite useful now, I'll use this especially now. So you can see that these two things, that's the temperature and that solar activity from 1880. And they, they're kind of roughly tracking each other until towards the end of the last century. And then we see how uh -huh, temperature goes up, but actually solar energy goes down. So it's not the sun. The sun cannot be accounting for the current climate change. Now, another uh, topic, which I laugh because um, my dear friend Colin would love to spend an hour talking about this, um, which is the Milankovitch cycles, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so don't worry. But this is global warming. So there are three types of global warming. You know, brilliant Serbian mathematician. Why? You know, why should Serbian mathematics produce this result? I've never quite understood that. But anyway, the Serbian mathematician Malankovic in 1913 published papers which proved that the Earth doesn't have um, a perfectly circular orbit around the sun. Sometimes it becomes elliptical over a 100,000 year period. 
Then there's the obliquity, so that's the rocking, this is huge and exaggerated, but that's the obliquity where it rocks a little bit backwards and forwards on its axis. And that's a 41,000 year cycle. And then it sort of twists a little bit around its top like that. That's called precession, and that's on a 26,000 year cycle. Well, I don't probably need to say anything about those. You'll understand that those time frames are so great they can't possibly account for the current rise in global warming. And indeed, under Milankovitch, the climate should be cooling as indeed it was, as you have seen from the Michael Mann slide. Now, albedo sounds like a dog, doesn't it? Albedo is something that we all know about, but it doesn't explain global warming. Albedo is what happens when you're in a dark car, a black car, on a hot summer's day, and you're an extra white car at the traffic lights, and the people in the white car seem to be quite comfortable, but you and your black car are struggling. Why? Why? Because the sun, of course, the rays of the sun, warming up your black car more than the white car, because the white car reflects the sunlight back. And that is the albedo effect, okay? Okay, so looking at planet Earth, um, the classic case there, of course, is snow, that's the white car or ice. Um, so where you've got um, an ice cap, then a lot of that heat that comes in from the sun is reflected straight back. But when the ice melts, you've got land underneath or sea underneath, then it absorbs more energy, and so more energy comes in from the sun. That's called the albedo effect. It's, um, an amplifying feedback is what the climate scientists call it. Um, but it don't, it's not a cause of global, global warming, it's just part of the global warming process. Volcanoes, now volcanoes, people love to talk about volcanoes, but actually they can't possibly account for global warming. Um, the main reason is that when I a volcano bursts into life and spews up all this dust into the atmosphere. Generally speaking, the result is cooling in the local area because even uh, sunlight doesn't manage to get through that. Sunlight gets through uh, greenhouse gases, but it doesn't get through those heavy clouds put up by volcanoes. So on the whole, volcanoes cause cooling, not warming. The arrangements of the continents, well that again is a non-starter because I'm sure everyone knows we're separating from America at the rate of 2.5 centimetres a year um, and probably uh, that whole business of uh, continents drifting around the, uh, the world has never happened at a faster rate than that. So the arrangements of the continents can't possibly explain current climate change. So the only thing we're left with ladies and gentlemen, is the greenhouse effect. It's the only natural thing, and it is natural by the way. Let's come on to the next slide, the greenhouse effect. Now the greenhouse effect, for those of us who have trouble understanding the greenhouse effect, I'm trying to simplify it as simple as it possibly can be made. That great ball of fire, the sun, produces energy, huge amounts of energy, a tiny bit of that energy reaches Earth, but it comes in the form of light, doesn't it? You see it, you can see the light coming in. So these are short wavelengths heat rays. There is UV light, of course, that's why we get sunburned. But most of the sun's energy comes as light. And that light cuts through greenhouse gases, no problem at all. So um, it does get reflected in that a little bit like clouds, absolutely like volcanic uh, clouds as well, but it's not affected by greenhouse gases. The energy from the sun comes to planet Earth. The planet Earth doesn't absorb it all, it wants to give some of it back, otherwise we'd all burn up very quickly. But of course the Earth doesn't glow like the sun, does it? It gives back energy, but it gives it back as infrared rays, much longer wavelength. And those infrared rays are the ones that are caught by the greenhouse gases, particularly CO2, water vapour, methane. 
So that is the greenhouse effect. Sunlight comes through greenhouse gases to the Earth. The Earth reflects some of it back into the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases capture that energy that's reflected back into the atmosphere. And that's what causes our atmosphere to warm up. But greenhouse gases aren't in themselves a bad thing. We actually need greenhouse gases because without them, the Earth's temperature would be 30 degrees Celsius lower than it is at the moment, which means, frankly, that life would be impossible. So it's not so much greenhouse gases as such that are bad, it's just the amount at the moment is going up uh, at a faster rate than the Earth can cope with. And of course, uh, one planet that is, is virtually entirely greenhouse gas, the atmosphere is Venus. And that is so hot that it's actually hotter than Mercury, even though Mercury is closer to the Sun. And you could also say that uh, Mars, of course, without any greenhouse gases, is extremely cold. So that's why sometimes Earth is called the Goldilocks planet, isn't it? Because we've got just about the of everything. But even on the greenhouse gas side, we're now getting too much. I hope that isn't too complicated an explanation. It's the simplest I can manage. Um, but this next slide, hopefully you can also um, get hold of this very easily. The top slide described as the lower troposphere, well that's the bit <coughs> we're in, that's you and me right now this evening. And that is taken, the, uh, these are temperature measurements taken by satellite over a period of years. I have to run myself actually. Yeah, it goes back to 1980, it's been 1980 and 2010. And these are very contrasting slides. The bottom one is the lower stratosphere, that's the bit above where we are now. So where we are now is warming, and the lower stratosphere, which is above where the greenhouse gases are, is cooling. And that's why this is called the smoking gun, because this proves, really, that the satisfaction of climate scientists at least, that global warming is caused by greenhouse gases because the reason why the stratosphere is cooling is because the greenhouse gases are stopping the, that infrared radiated heat coming out of the sun, it stops it going back into the stratosphere. Are you with me on that? Is that reasonably okay? Right, I'm moving on. Okay, so You've seen that one before, haven't you? That slide. You've seen a very similar one, haven't you? Yeah. It's not the same, is it? What's different about that one? It's not the temperature. It's not the temperature. It's the CO2. Why not Hang on. Sorry. Let's use it. Let's use Now we've had plenty of time to work out what that is. <coughs> CO2 levels. Now there it was, bobbing along in the pre-industrial phase at about 280 parts per million. Last year it got above 400 parts per million for the first time. And this year, at the moment, it's running at 404 parts per million, but it's still going up. You can see it, it's still going up, you know, it's going like that. And that's why climate scientists are so worried about what's going on with the planet at the moment. So, uh, those earlier measurements, by the way, are taken from ice cores, taken from a place called Law Dome, which is in Antarctica. So, let's superimpose on that slide the uh, the Michael Mann graph. I'll do it again, actually it happens. This is a very nice bit of slide creation by Colin here. So you can see the two merging into each other, seeing how they run in parallel the CO2 and the temperature. And if you remember, that's what Richard Muller said on, on that little video clip when he saw the link between temperature and CO2. 
And that's what he was talking about. So, the last bit I'll run through very, very quickly because I think we've been here before. Why should we care? Weather extremes, sea level rises. Don't forget about this, displacing millions of people because if we don't get this right, if we don't get it under control, just think about what percentage of the world's population lives near sea level. Uh, it's a high percentage, I'm not even going to suggest a figure. I don't think anyone's come up with an accurate figure yet. But a lot of people live very close to sea level on this planet. <coughs> Another thing, uh, yes, displacing populations, but also creating havoc in the plant world because plants can't adjust to climate changes in the same way we can. They take a long time. Um, so they can't do it in the matter of a few years. And that is one of the other issues about rapid climate change. So, and these are Colin's words here, throughout the history, yes, climate change has generally benefited some species, but others become extinct, and we're at the moment on the verge of another mass extinction. I'm sure that sounds like an old testament prophet, but we are actually, we're losing species already at a very rapid rate. As humans, we'll almost certainly survive, but by the end of this century, we're going to be living on a very different planet. And that will happen even if we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow. This is the thing. Because there's a lot of CO2 out there, and it doesn't just disappear as soon as you turn the tap off. CO2 takes thousands of years to disappear entirely from the atmosphere. It starts disappearing very quickly, but it's not something that suddenly disappears once you've stopped the inflow. So now let's go back to Paris for a bit. Um, just remind ourselves what was decided in Paris. Well, there was this <clears throat> tremendous ambition to uh, reduce temperatures to uh, below uh, two, 2 degrees Celsius. But the pledges made at that time were never going to reach anything like that. At the moment, it's um, estimated that between 3 and 3.5% 3 and Celsius is the best that can be managed. The other problem with Paris was that it, there's no legally binding commitment. It's all about peer, peer pressure. So what's happened so far? Well, last year we got to the one degree Celsius over pre <coughs> Um By now it's, it's roughly 1.3 degrees Celsius. So the chances of getting to 1.5 are absolutely, and it's, it's just it's, it's a no over. It's never going to happen. Um, even if we go. Well, it says that, an extremely aggressive shift to renewables to get to 2 degrees Celsius is also going to be, as they say, a big task. A big task. And this is Colin's lovely piece from Colin here. Can, can we go back? Let's, let's, let's have another 25 years to get it sorted out, please. But Colin, we haven't got it, have we? We haven't got the time. Um, so, but it, as it does add the urgency, because we've been so slow to get to grips with this as, a, as an international issue. So what can we do? Well, thank you for coming tonight. Um, become knowledgeable about the issues. Push politicians to make the right choices. And Keith will be talking about a pledge at the end, if you haven't already signed it. Um, because uh, there's, there's no harm at all in trying to put pressure on the politicians in whatever way we can. Move out of uh, investments in the oil industry and so on. Um, and at home, well, free, you get free smart meters if you're into that sort of thing. Um, eat less meat because uh, cattle produces methane, which is an excellent greenhouse gas. Um, insulation, I think we all know about that. Um, possibly leave the car at home and generally try to live more sustainably. Um, and help the, the green economy. Which, so there is a question. England has, or Britain has, an excellent green economy at the moment. There are loads of jobs out there in renewable energy, um, in things like 
vocals with the double glazing sound and you can hang on, what's all over? Well, it's part of the green economy, isn't it? Trying to save as fuel. Um, so there's a lot of things that we can do to make global warming um, happen more slowly. It won't stop it, but one of the things we can do is to do our bit to try and reduce our carbon footprints at home. And by supporting the green economy, we're helping to do that. So now we're going to move to the last phase, ignore that slide for a moment, because we're going to come back to it. Now we're going to hear from Colin. Now this piece that uh, he recorded at home a few days ago. Um, he comes to you with an American accent, but I assure you that Colin has not got an American accent. The reason why he's, uh, he's recorded it is because he wants to reserve um, his, his breath really for answering questions at the end, okay? So I'm going to try and get him speaking, it may take a couple of minutes, on the, on the loudspeakers. First of all, I'd like to thank Ian for his help in putting this presentation together, and indeed giving the talk. If motoneuron disease has benefits, one is surely that you get to know people who you would otherwise never have met. It's said that people tend not to seek out the truth, rather they seek out people and information that confirm and reinforce their own existing ideas. Some of you will have come this evening already convinced of the urgency of climate change, and I'm very happy to reinforce your view. Others will still be developing an opinion on the subject and I hope the information we've presented will be instrumental in helping you reach an opinion. Some of you may have entered the room as confirmed skeptics. If you find yourself leaving with the same viewpoint, I would argue that the issue isn't one of establishing facts or determining the truth, rather it stems from a mindset that compels you to be different from the rest who are obviously far too easily taken in. The fossil fuel lobby is very rich and very powerful, but they realized some years ago that they were on the wrong side of the science of climate change. They adopted tactics developed a generation earlier by tobacco companies who had found themselves in a world where their products were suddenly responsible for literally millions of deaths. Rather than enter into a reasoned debate they couldn't win, they decided to sow confusion and try to persuade people that the science wasn't clear. Who were these scientists to tell people what they could and couldn't do anyway? The tactics work very well, particularly with people whose politics are right-wing and who believe that any form of government regulation should be challenged. As an added bit of color in the climate debate, it was suggested that all of the world's climate scientists, the vast majority of national science academies, NASA, NOAA, and the UK climate research community are all part of a socialist plot to voice green legislation and likely taxes on us. When you find yourself accusing the organization that put a man on the moon of fraud, as an Australian senator famously did recently when debating climate change with Brian Cox, you know you're on the wrong side of history. Before I finish up, I would like to talk briefly about carbon budgets. We are told we should keep temperature rise to less than 2 degrees Celsius, but it's not clear what this actually means. It's been estimated that humanity has pumped something like 2,100 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere since the start of the Industrial Revolution. This has raised the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere from perhaps 280 ppm in the mid-1700s to 404 ppm today. The temperature has also risen by perhaps 1.3 degrees Celsius. Currently we emit around 40 billion tons of CO2 each year, with so far, no real sign of any slowdown. Work has been done by the IPCC to estimate how much more CO2 we can afford to emit before we break the 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius barriers. The numbers aren't very reassuring. 
for a 66% chance of keeping the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius we can emit no more than a further 200 billion tons of CO2. This is just 5 years at the current annual emission rate. For a 66% chance of keeping within 2 degrees Celsius, we can emit no more than 800 billion tons, that's 20 years at today's emission rate. Despite the near certainty that we will crash through the 2 degrees Celsius barrier in around 25 years, I believe there is some cause for optimism. A renewables revolution is advancing at breakneck speed, with ever cheaper and ever more efficient wind turbines and solar panels. The development of technology to harness predictable and reliable tidal power is well underway. The UK has recently announced the go-ahead for the world's largest offshore wind farm and the price of renewables without subsidy is already comparable to fossil fuels in many places. The only question in my mind is how quickly will we move from a 19th century technology, namely burning fossil fuel, to 21st century technology such as robust and reliable renewable energy. I hope that we have demonstrated the urgency of the situation, the time for talking ended a good while back. Whether we knuckle down and face the challenge, or whether we just keep talking, is now down to us. We have a choice whether we allow fracking, whether we allow oil companies to explore in the newly opened Arctic, whether we continue to use the atmosphere as the equivalent of an open sewer for our pollution. Basically whether we want to live more or less sustainably. Hence it's down to all of us to pressure politicians and to support companies and technologies that will move us towards a future without pollution, and without the need to pay immense sums of money to Middle Eastern regimes. Thank you for listening. Well, that's, uh, thank you, Colin. So that actually is the end of the presentation. Um, so I'm just, having just listened to Colin there, um, I think you could, you could have done the whole thing like that, actually. <laughs> you got very impressed on it. And that would be nice to sure. Anyway, um, hopefully the science wasn't too complicated. Um, but if you have any questions, this is the time to start um, asking them. Colin has got a microphone there. Um, so he, he will use his English accent to answer, not his American accent. <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, please. Um, well, I can repeat the question. Yeah. The question. If you try to speak up, then uh, then it means. <coughs> yes, please. Yeah. Um, one of the slides talked about the infrared, uh, not to say it now, the yeah. uh, there and then into the stuff like that. And, and of course, the, the increase in CO2 coincides with the CO2 emissions, etc. It also coincides with the deforestation of the planet as well, which obviously a lot of the CO2 would have been passed inside with the growing timber and then going into the bed trees, coal, and all the rest of it. So, was burning the coal, releasing that CO2, which is built upon the safety. But my question would be as it, it's not necessarily a quick way to do but if the interest uh, raises more than the, um, the greenhouse effect, there's a lot of way of harvesting the infrared rays to generate some of the energy that we're never producing through fossil fuels. I'm sorry, Colin. No, 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 Yeah. 
they've shown that because we have already started reducing CO2 drastically, we will need to develop some technology beyond 2050 that could pull out probably 40 billion Reforest the, the, the planet over here. Because I know that's a slower effect. Okay, so go back 2,000 years, Britain was maybe 3,000 years. Europe was fully forested. CO2 was at 280 ppm. It's now 400 and whatever and rising. <coughs> because Yes, you're right, the carbon from the tree, also all the fossil fuel that we've dug up. All that carbon was coal and the oil, and it was buried away from the atmosphere. So, can, can we stop on that one actually? Because I think we could spend a lot of time on the carbon cycle. I think we've got very loud. Um, the carbon cycle. It's so, so complicated. I've tried to understand more about the carbon cycle myself. We've got the slow carbon cycle, the fast carbon cycle. Um, of course, plants, they give CO2 back to the atmosphere, and then they suck it back a bit, so you've got the seasonal variations. So it's all very, very complex. But I think the point that Chris made was, is there an opportunity, is there a chance to be able to get some of, some of um, the damage undone by some processes currently not known. And I think what IPCC and so on, they're looking for ways, but at the moment, carbon capture, for example, would be a wonderful idea to be able to suck it out of the atmosphere, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so there's one quick comment, because I wondered if there would be a carbon capture question. So if you look at how much carbon we need to remove, and you look at the amount of weight a tree or a forest puts on in a year, we would need a hundred times the surface area of England. England. It feels like a moment to arrive when really, rather than sitting here, we should all be out trying to push a big political movement forward on it. I can only applaud that, I think. That's absolutely right. Now, China is an interesting one because they're put up as the world's bad boy, but China has got its own issues with pollution. Um, I was allowed to recently there building, was it two windmills every hour or something? They are by far and away the world's biggest investor in renewables. The change that's happening there is colossal. And, but I think you're right that we should pressurise where we can and just be aware of the issue. I uh, was listening to some of the presentations today. Uh, there was a scientist from Manchester University who pointed out that while we all sit here thinking two degrees, won't we? Won't we? Two degrees will result. It's a death. Oh, many, many people. Not in Bakersfield, but in Bakersfield. Right, I'm going to stop with that one. One more question, actually. <coughs> just over here, yeah, you, you, sorry. Well, we might just take two. Okay, two. So one from the front, one from the back, you, sir. I'm afraid you're the others, because we're having to protect Colin a little bit. Because, you know, 
takes a lot of puff. So please, as David Buckley, see your presentation. I'm not talking about it here, honestly. Who's happy to be conservative government? The new one. Who's handling it? Yes, this the well, subject. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, actually, I slightly that one because yeah, well, I did, well, the reason why I, I, I wanted to do it, because in, the, in preparing for tonight's talk, I, I Googled you know, both parts, and both the main ones, this one, um, to see what they you know, had to say about climate change. And um, frankly, there's not a lot. Um, the, okay, so the Conservatives say they will ratify the, the Paris Agreement. That's fantastic, ratifying the agreement. So that's nothing. Um, I mean, there are, there are good stories in this country, that's not going to wait for it. But the government itself seems to be extremely ambivalent about its approach to climate change. And this is going to come off this ambivalence in the near future with our dear friend fracking, won't it, you know, because um, Osborne was in favour of fracking. He wanted, because any Chancellor is going to see the advantage of uh, trying to get loads of money in, you know, it's going to solve lots of financial um, problems for the country, but it's not going to solve the climate change problem. So I, I would say at the moment that the uh, Conservative Party is very ambivalent about its approach. As far as Labour is concerned, well, Jeremy did mention it's one of his bullet points yesterday, but it was, I think, sixth down the list, and really, he didn't really make much of it. So it's there. Um, sadly, in some ways, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's got a brother who's uh, a climate change denier, um, who believes it's all to do with the, uh, the sun. Um, so, all I can say, sir, is that I don't think that our leaders are at the moment totally convinced in the way that I hope everyone here is about the need to take very urgent action. We cannot wait any longer. And we're doing it not just to protect ourselves, but our children, our grandchildren, and generations to come. Last question, please. Uh, oh, hi, Colin. Just a quick one. I mean, one thing which is pretty obvious looking at all this data and the stuff we've all seen before is, you know, something needs to be done quickly. Okay, there's going to be new technologies in years to come, like, you know, to absorb carbon and this type thing. There's going to be more electric cars, we'll have nuclear fusion. Well, that's way down the line. Now, don't you think now we've got to realize what we've got now? So, don't you think we've got the responsibility to sort of be better to stop objecting to like wind power, which people do? And also nuclear power, which once it's going, doesn't you know give out carbon dioxide. Just want your opinion on that. I think the one thing that is clear is we have the technology today to solve the problem. So do we burn or do we live? That really is the. Uh, the question, we have electric cars, and I'm actually quite optimistic. Ten years from now, the world will look different with regards to electric cars. It's changing, we just need to keep pressure to make sure it changes fast enough. Don't let the government off the hook. <laughs> Right, I think on that note, um, I think I'll go back to hand over to Keith Taylor at this point. So that's the end of the, uh, the presentation anyway. But before Keith starts talking, frankly, all the um, appreciation should go to Colin. It was Colin Clive. I was just here acting as his husband.
to research and has come up with such a convincing account of the uh, climate change uh, issues uh, and uh, have, uh, uh, these have been put before us this evening uh, in such a compelling way. I think it's uh, a wonderful thing that we had this opportunity uh, and I'd like to thank Colin and I'd like to thank Ian too, he was very modest uh, just now but his presentation was very really good and uh, another clap would not go on this. <laughs> stuck in a time war, uh, to hope for the support they've given to this evening and the petition, about which I'll speak in a minute, uh, to the Methodist Church uh, for uh, providing the premises, such excellent premises, uh, for uh, the, the talk to be given, uh, to you all for coming along and uh, indicating your support uh, for at least investigating the issue of, of climate change. And to those of you who have already signed the petition, can I talk about the petition? Uh, we are, uh, th th there's, there's a, a body at the back of, uh, of this, uh, the Climate Coalition, uh, which is a, uh, a coalition of a number of bodies, including CAFOG and uh, Christian Aid who are here tonight, plus uh, about a hundred other organisations, some faith-based, some uh, developmental, uh, some uh, quite uh, surprising to find in amongst them, uh, like the uh, Women's Institute and the uh, RPB, uh, Society for Birds, Birds. They have called for uh, a, a week of action uh, to bring to the attention of MPs our concerns about climate change. And in Macclesfield, the way this is being done, alongside other uh, things which you can talk about uh, with Capel and, and Christian Aid, uh, is the petition uh, which a number of people have signed here and uh, which uh, Hope has encouraged all member churches uh, to sign. We uh, at the moment have 700 signatures on this. Uh, some of us have been out at, at Treacle Market getting uh, the passers by to sign. In passing, could I say that I am absolutely staggered when uh, asked for, for a signature on a petition, uh, people say, what's it about? And if I say it's climate change, a lot of them, a vast majority of them, sign without any, uh, any demur. It, it does seem to be something in the uh, atmosphere which is convincing people. We need. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I thought that would be the sort of political uh, uh, media uh, yeah, environment. But uh, politicians need convincing. So, uh, what I'm hoping to do uh, on the 14th of October, which is the week in which this uh, climate, the climate coalition has called for, uh, for action, uh, that we meet with. Uh, David Rutley, he has already agreed to meet at, the, uh, at St Michael's Church. He knows it's going to be a photo opportunity and a handover of as many signatures as we can get. We've got 700. I started off hoping that we would get 2,000. Uh, with, with a bit of effort we can get closer to that. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to come along and be there so we can get a photo opportunity handover of the, uh, the petition and 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, we've got 80 people here tonight, could you all come and uh, show the support for action by politicians on climate change on the part of the churches and other organisations, if not only churches. So, um, would you think about that? 14th of October, St Michael's, 4 o'clock. I think that's everything I should do. Is there anything else?